All right, let's, let's start off with what we left off on last time, and that is the one statement that I had mentioned is a very key statement where I said button this is doing is this is creating a button object. An object again is, is a, 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 a an object is probably better called an object reference and this isn't really creating I, I kind of misspoke this isn't really creating a button object because that button object got created when we ran the app. All right, When we fired up the app and that XML file gets inflated into our GUI. We have the button on the screen. What this does is this points to the button that got created. All right. So we're going to create an object reference variable. An object reference variable is a variable that contains a pointer to an object. All right. Because more than one, more than one variable can point to the same object. All right. So we're creating a variable that points to a button. What button? Well, we're going to find that button in the view. What view are we going to find it on? We're going to find it in the main view, the main content view. All right? There's no prefix here, so we know we're looking at the main content view for this Android app. We'll use this later on to find a view within another view, a different view. All right? Views can sort of be, it's almost like with HTML where you can have stuff nested. You can have views inside of views, all right? You can make tables, all right, in, in your uh, Android uh, um, GUI. And you can point to a table row. Then you can find something in that specific table row that has an ID. And if you did that, there'd be something before this. But because there's nothing before this, we're finding on the main content view, the thing that has the ID of calc. Where did it get, where did the button get the ID of calc? From the XML file, one of the attributes. And again, when I put the projector on, we'll take a look at it. But uh, one of the attributes in the XML file says, hey, when you create this button, assign it this ID. So this, if you will, sort of links the GUI to the program. Um, Sometimes you hear the phrase model view controller, whereas model are like your objects that you're going to be using, um, your business rule or problem domain rule objects. The view is the user interface, all right? And the controller is the, piece of, the pieces of code that sort of glue everything together. Well, this is an example of it being glued together. Now, find view by ID is used to find any sort of view, all right? any sort of view. That's why we have to cast it as a button. We have to tell it, hey, the view that you find that has an ID of calc, I know it's a button. I know because I made it. All right? So treat it like a button. Whatever view you find, treat it as though it's a button. Why? Because I want to do button things to it. If you remember last time we talked about polymorphism, a button is a view, which is a this, which is a that. We can go up the hierarchy of inheritance. But if we want to do button things to this, we have to treat it like a button. And the way that you treat it uh, uh, like a button is by casting it to a button. This is simply going to return a view. And what kind of view? I don't know. It'll find any view. All right. We know, though, that that's a button, and we want to treat it like a button. So we need, we need to cast it as a button. So now we have a variable called calc that points to that button on the screen. 
Now we can do stuff with it. All right? Questions about that? This is like a workhorse. Um, we'll see this like in everything we write. Why? Well, because we have to somehow link our UI to the code that's running behind it. So anything on the UI that the user can interact with that we're going to use to do something with, we're going to have to do something along these lines with. So let's look at let's look at this again. And let's take a look at the UI to see the There's our instruction there. If we look at our UI, don't tell me I didn't close these files from last time. So I still have them. Still have text edit. Here we go with. Here's the button. That's how I got the ID of calc. The sort of plus in front of it means that this guy is creating a new ID. Is adding to the list of resources an ID called calc. As opposed to in other cases, like here, we're not adding anything to the string file, we're just pointing to something that's already there. Does, for the most part, does uh, Eclipse and Android Studio add the XML in for you? Because I'm noticing that more and more as I get into it. It seems like it auto generates the XML. It'll auto generate like a shell of an XML. Yeah. Yeah. Because like when I added the Chapter three, when it has you add an image box and right. name it, right? Or not an image box. I'm sorry, a text box. It looks like it automatically creates all of the XML in there for you, and then as you change properties, it adds the code into the XML. Format. Oh yeah. In other words, in other words, this view is where I'm teaching. I'm teaching the Apple class and the Android class. So I have to really remember what, what, what <laughs> half of my brain to activate on a given day. Yeah. I was going to say, where's my storyboard at? But no, that's I, iPhone. Yeah, this has a graphical view. And you can go and drag it. But a couple things. It's almost like in CISS 243. It's good to know the actual code. So. Yeah. is good to go and be able to look at it. So this is just, and again, I get I get this problem all the time that it can't render it for me. Uh, probably because... It's a Mac. Case Allen sees it's video. Yeah, there you go. All right, probably because of the API I'm using. But the XML view is just the XML that the graphical view creates, generates. So yeah, in that regard, yeah, both of them do do that. All right, here's the next big thing that we're going to talk about. Calc. Set on click. What is calc? Again, calc is a, a pointer. It's an object reference. It's a pointer that points to that button. And we set the on click listener. Well, that's a button thing to do, right? That's why we had to make it a button. What do you do with buttons? You click on them. Buttons have on-click listeners. Other views don't necessarily have an on-click listener. But we set on-click listener to this. And again, the question came out, what do we mean when we say this? What we mean is the object itself that this code is contained in. So in this example, this is my Oh, that's all right. Is that any better or was it better than the first one? You sound like the eye doctor. There we go. Which is better, this way or this way? More clear, less clear. This is 
the activity, this example activity. So when I say set, where do I say it? Set on click listener to this, I'm saying that this object itself, the instance of this class, this object itself is going to be the on click listener. Can any object be set to be an on click listener for a button? <laughs> yeah, that's your other, the other option. Maybe. No. A, a class or an object has to be qualified to do it. It has to be able to serve in that role. All right? It has to be able to serve in that role. So it has to be authorized to, like, certified as a button handler. How do you certify or how do you... How do you state to the Java world that you're able to serve in a particular role? You do that by implementing an interface. All right. Implementing an interface says, uh, again, I'm, ever since my first computer teacher, you know, you sort of personify the computer and speak in the program's voice, but when it says implements interface, it says I am qualified. This object, objects that are instances of this class, is qualified to be an on-click listener. So anywhere you need an on-click listener, you can plug this guy in. All right. So your question, when I said could any object be an on-click listener, any object whose class implements the on-click listener could be the on-click listener, but it would have to implement that. This effectively says, I can serve in the role of being an on-click listener. If a, if a class were to inherit this class, would it inherit the on-click as well? If it inherited the class, yes, it would, it would inherit. It would also implement on-click listener. Yes. So, you know, think of this like... Uh, Trying to think uh, uh, of an example, you know, you're, um, you know, you're, uh, uh, you know, you have, you have job, you know, um, job clearances, you know, in the, in the, uh, you know, in the military or in the FBI or whatever. Implement says I can do this job. All right, I'm authorized to do this job. Now. Is that where it ends? Once I implement it, does that mean that I'm all set? No, I have to do one more thing to make this able to be the on-click listener for it. I said I'm qualified to be an on-click listener. I therefore better have the functions that an on-click listener requires. So when you implement an interface, all an interface is is a list of functions that Anything that implements it has to implement those methods. And in the case of an on-click listener, there's only one function that it needs to implement, and that is the on-click method. Now, is there, is there, since there's an on-click uh, uh, listener, is there also, like, for a, a, a button press and a button depress, um, there, there are other listeners, yes. I'm not sure of those particular ones. Um, I would almost assume that there are because Java is used primarily in a lot of video games. Yeah. Um, actually, actually, those kinds of things might not be with buttons, but there would be like listeners. There's like gesture listeners to list, uh, to uh, there, you can you can create a gesture listener to listen for a tap, a double tap, a long tap and a fling. Yeah. So if you want to fling things, yes? Yeah, I was also kind of wondering, because um, you're using the, uh, the set uh, method instead of the add method. Is it Where am I using the set method instead? Whatever, whatever. I might not be using the correct language. I'll have to excuse me. I taught myself Java. Well, well <laughs> okay, wh 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 where? OK, uh, yeah, when you have like the, the, the on, uh, you know, set, um, you know, on click listener, OK, I know there's also, there's add listeners. I, 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 
get what you're saying. First of all, I question whether there is simply an add listener method on a view. Here's all the methods that are available on a view, and there is not an add listener method. So in another context, other in another framework or in another application, you might be able to add multiple listeners for this. In this case, we're adding a listener for a specific action, and that is the click action. So okay, What did you just say? I'm saying that you can, you can add, okay, certain type, you can use the add method for multiple listeners on the objects. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, well, I'll, I'll take a look at it. Um, at any rate, this is setting a specific listener. This is setting the on click listener for that. Um, maybe after lecture we can take a look at it real quick just so I can get a sense for that. Um, typically that's what you do because that defines, I guess, I guess what um, I guess what I'm confused about is if you had an interface that implemented a couple different listeners and you added that listener what it would be listening for. Would it be listening for interface A or interface B? So. Um, all right, at any rate, um, we're adding an on-click listener. So if I implement an interface, that means that whatever methods exist in that interface, I need to code for. All right? So if I say that I can handle an on-click, all right, by implementing the on-click listener, I better go and have an on-click event on here. And that's the case for every interface that's defined. When you have an interface, an interface is simply a list of methods that must be, must be used by anything that implements that. You know, actually I found out that an interface that implements an interface can pick and choose what method it, methods it wants to use. 
I don't know why you would interface would implement an interface, but that's the loophole around the interface. Uh, um, yeah, I, I've never seen an example of that. No, neither have I. I looked up the other day, like, top five things programmers should know but should never mm -hmm. do, and that's right. implementing an interface into an interface, because then you don't have to use all the methods. Here is, for example, the documentation on the on click listener. And the public method is, the public abstract method is the on click. So that's the only one method that you need to implement for that. Other interfaces will have more than one. All right. And to sort of prove that, if I go and I call this on click method, something else and click A instantly I get a little compile message saying hey you promised that this guy can handle on clicks that this guy can serve in the roles of an on click listener um, however it does not have all it does not implement all the methods for that class Therefore, you're out of luck, and it won't compile. All right. So, what happens when you click it? I actually did this a couple different ways. What happens when you click it? Well. I created, in this example, I created a meal class, all right? We'll talk about that in a second. The next four lines do essentially the same thing as we did with the button, except for the different text controls. Edit text, text view, spinner, checkbox, and so on. So I'm pointing to all those things that are part of the main content view. All right. I then go and I create either a breakfast object or just a plain meal object. If you remember, the way this problem was defined was that breakfast was subject to one set of tipping rules and other meals were subject to another set. Again, just more than anything to demonstrate um, inheritance in this case. I call a couple of set methods to set the cost of the meal object and the level of service, and then I call the calc tip method get back an answer, then take that answer and put it on my screen. Put it back in the text box. Questions about that? I said that I declared my object reference variable m as a meal, and yet I said m equals new breakfast. Why is that allowed? Right, but I'm creating a new breakfast object and not a new meal object. How is that allowable? I mean, this makes sense, yeah. but this, how is that? Because breakfast is a meal, exactly. In other words, when I declare a object reference variable am for meal, I can put any kind of meal in there. In object-oriented terms, I can put in a meal or I can put anything that extends meal. Because right. breakfast is a meal. All I have to do is put some sort of meal in there. Is it, is it actually inheriting? 
is and the breakfast class is inheriting. Right, the breakfast class. Okay, but if it, if it wasn't inheriting, it, it would give you a compile. It would give you a compile there because it would say, hey, I, you have to give me a meal here, and breakfast is not a meal. All right. Now notice. There's the breakfast class. Notice it extends meal. That means it inherits from meal. And here's the meal class. that there is your basic meal class and it has some attributes. The attributes are protected. First of all, what does protected mean? It means that only, only this and any classes that inherit from it can, can, manipulate. can, can, can manipulate those variables. Right. Uh, generally speaking, you make, you make uh, attributes protected or private. If there's no inheritance, protected and private would, would do the same thing. But if you have the potential to inherit from it, protective, protected allows you to manipulate it in the class itself and in any class it inherits from it. Why do we make our attributes private or protected? What would the, what would the other alternative be? Public, make them public. You don't want the user messing with them. All right. You don't want the user. And by user... We don't mean the person that has the Android device. Anyway, it's a whole class. We're talking about anyone that's using your classes, right? We're talking about other developers. Why in a case like this, and again, this is a very bare bones example to be sure, but why in a case like this would I not want someone to directly manipulate the cost or the service attributes? I'm not doing it here, but what could I do? You could set it to $500 if you wanted to and make them think they owe the person a $1,000 <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> All right. The problem is, is I could probably, I, I could put validation in here that says that the cost of a meal has to be more than zero. All right. And so you couldn't go up and show the waitress and say, hey, look, you owe me five bucks. All right. I could put validation to make sure that the, the, the level, of, level of service was one of a specified list of things. I think it's one, two, or three in this case, or zero, one, and two. Um, I think zero, one, and two. If you can directly manipulate attributes, you can circumvent any of those controls. So you could go in and you could set things. Think of your methods as being the public interface of your classes to the rest of the world. You know, it's like if you have speakers here. You know, we're not going to take and wire the speakers directly to the sound card. All right? Why? That's risky. You're probably going to mess something up if you do that. Instead, what do you do? They provided you a jack. That's your way of interfacing your speaker with the sound card. Plug it in the jack. All right? That's easy to do. Anyone can do that. And if you have the wrong kind of jack, you know, you have the wrong, you have some of those old school headphones with the gigantic headphone jack, and you try to plug it in, it just won't fit. All right? So that guarantees that you don't mess something up by doing that. All right? We want our classes to be the same way. We don't want people to get into the guts of the class. So we provide methods to access and manipulate those attributes. And we make the attributes protected so no one can go in and directly do it. Still, you still have to set the cost of the meal, still have to set the uh, level of service, and that's what we have these setter functions for. They simply take the argument that was given and save it in there. Then we have a calculate tip 
method that goes and looks at the level of service based on the level of service it returns a value for a tip. Now, the breakfast class, because it extends meal, it gets everything that is associated with a meal and we can code what is different than the meal class. And what's different for the meal class is that we, we changed our rule for tipping. We're cheapskates in the morning because we're grumpy, all right? So we tip at a lower rate. So the only thing that's different in the meal class is the, I'm sorry, from the meal class in the breakfast class is the calc tip method, which goes in and calculates based on a different set of percentages. All right? Now, again, this is a very simple example, but it does follow the idea of the model view controller, the model being our business rules or problem domain rules, and that would be the classes that I've developed, the view being the user interface, and the controller being the code and the activity that glues these guys together, that pulls the values from the um, interface and creates these business or problem domain objects and then calls the appropriate methods and does, does something with the output. Now, here's an interesting thing with polymorphism. All right. I said M is a meal. All right. Here I say M equals new breakfast. Here I say M equals new meal. Let's say I have breakfast. Which method is going to get executed? This one or this one? First or second? The one on the breakfast or the one on the meal? Keeping in mind that I've declared M as a meal. It'll be the one on the breakfast. Why? Because an object is what an object is. This is a new breakfast object. Therefore, it uses the breakfast object version of the methods in case there's any methods. So don't think just because I declared that meal, that that variable m is meal, that it's going to treat it just as a meal and it will, um, it will um, use, um, you know, the, the wrong version. That's a breakfast object, so it uses the breakfast object's version of the tip calculation. All right. Now, Keep in mind, though, and I think I talked about this when I talked about casting, we have casted that variable, we're treating that variable like a, like a meal. So we'll get the right version of the calculate tip method because that calculate tip method is in both. If I created a method that was only in the breakfast class, though, I could not call it if I declare the variable as a meal. All right? Does that make sense? All right, so in other words, if I did this, I created another method, public void do nothing, exactly. So if I create a method that says public void do nothing, I cannot go in here and even if I'm right here, say am dot do nothing. Even though I know logically that that is a breakfast object because I just created it. It only knows the things associated with a meal. Why? Because all it sees here is that you have a cl uh, an object that's declared as a meal, and therefore you can only call meal methods on it. Now, to be sure, you get the breakfast version of those meal methods, but you don't get any methods that are distinct to breakfast. All right. That, in a nutshell, is polymorphism. Yes. If 
if I really wanted to do nothing, I could say, <laughs> well, that came out bad, breakfast B Are your kids listening to this at home? equals breakfast um, am. Then I could say B do nothing. All right, because now it knows that it is um, a breakfast object, so I can call breakfast methods on it. Now, the only problem is, is if there was something that happened, there was code between here and here, and somehow M got turned to a regular meal, this cast would blow up with an exception. out the do nothing method. Well, maybe I'll leave it in there. After all, it doesn't do anything, so I can use this next semester when I demonstrate this. Questions at this point? Now, this is one way This, in my mind, is the simplest way to create a listener. You simply make the activity, implement the on-click listener, and then add the on-click event to the activity. But you don't have to do that. All right, there's other things that you can do. So I'm going to unimplement this. All right. I'm going to change this to something else. Notice now. I can't say calc set on click, click listener to this. Why not? Because by getting rid of that implements interface, this class is no longer qualified to be an on click listener. That implements on click listener meant, hey, I'm qualified to be an on click listener. I got rid of that, so this is no longer qualified. So I get this error. It's not allowing this that because this is not qualified to be an on click listener. Now I do have down below here a class called my listener. All right. In my example, again, you wouldn't really need both of these. I have I have both of them in there just because I want to demonstrate this. All right. But another way that you could create a listener would be to say equals. New my listener. All right, and it should work the same way. Now, what's going to happen is my listener is going to, since it implements on click listener, and because it has an on click event, is qualified to be a listener. All right, specifically an on click listener, and therefore I can assign that to the button as the button's on click listener. Now, one thing. Notice this. Notice that this class, if you follow through the curly brackets, this class is part of this class. The class definition exists within the definition of the activity. That is called an inner class. Okay, one class is declared inside of another class. Why do I do that? Why do I make an inner class? Why didn't I make a totally separate class for this? A class within a class? Yeah, why did I why did I do that? I did that for, for a specific reason. I didn't, I didn't that. Yeah. You, you, yeah, you you can. You started the class. Yeah. Or, or is it all in the same? In other words, let me just let me just pull up this class. Yep. Exactly. That way you can use the variables and stuff of the class. So 
without, without inheriting or without passing them as arguments or whatever. Yeah. All right. So if you notice here, here's where the, the class starts. If we th follow through our curly brackets, left and right, we'll notice that that is at the end. This inner class that I defined goes from there to there. So it's defined within the class. And the reason for it is exactly the reason it was mentioned. Now I can do things like I can call the find view by ID because this is inside the other class. So I can call other methods on that class. So for that reason, I would define an inner class as opposed to some other sort of listener. If I defined it in its own separate class file and it was not an inner class, I would have to somehow get those values from the text box and et cetera in there. And that would probably be a pain. All right. Keep in mind when you're designing code, <coughs> a goal is always maintainability. And a goal is always writing something one time and not having to rewrite it over and over again. All right. But that is less of an issue for things like listeners because listeners are very specific to a particular controller and UI. You're probably not going to be reusing a listener. All right. It's the glue between classes. So by me putting this in here, as part of this class, I can't use it anywhere else, but I'm not too bothered about that because I there's probably not going to be an occasion to do that at any rate. All right. Questions? We're going to see in the next example, the Dito calculator one, if I can find it, we're going to see uh, another example of declaring an on-click listener, and we'll see some additional controls as well. Let me go and try to bring that guy in. Let me go in. You had asked about it last time. Let, let me let me actually do do it on screen so that we can see it. You go up to File, Import. You want an existing Android code in the workspace. Click Next. Browse for it. I don't remember where it is, but I can guess. Code Examples Original, maybe in there. Tip Calculator. That would be the one. And then I can open it, finish, and it brings it in. All right. Let's look at Deedle's tip calculator, and we'll see some different things about it compared to the previous examples we've seen. We'll see, one thing we'll definitely see for sure is we'll definitely see the creating of the listener in a different way. And we'll probably see some other differences too. Or we won't because I just unplugged the Okay, this is weird. Now I have it on both screens. I guess. Ah. It is griping because I already have it installed on this device. So I'm going to go and uninstall it on this, on this device.
Okay. So now we'll try again. Oh, actually, that must be a new feature. It, I, I didn't read the screen closely enough. It did already ask me if I wanted to uninstall, so I didn't need to unplug it and uninstall. All right, here's Dito's calculator. Is it the tip calculator? The tip calculator. Yeah. I got that All right, good. I didn't have to pay anything for it. Don't tell Dito. <laughs> All right, you have... text box for the bill. Notice that, actually I lied, this doesn't have a click listener at all. Alright? Because as I put in the amount, it calculates the tip. Alright? So there's no button to click like mine. Like mine you went in and typed in the amount and then click calculate and it calculated that. It's a text change show, sir? Yes. So that's a live update then. That's pretty yep. cool. does is this goes and this calculates the tip based on 10, 15, and 20 percent, shows you the total bill, which is a tip plus the, uh, plus the total of the bill. There also is a slider control for like putting in a tip percentage, like hmm, maybe it wasn't quite good enough for 20 percent, but I'll slide it and we'll give them 19%. And then it shows the tip in total for that. Alright. So, as we look at this, we can sort of guess, we can sort of in our mind, and again, I, I, I always encourage students when you're faced with a new problem like this to sort of take a mental inventory of what parts of this look suspicious like you've seen it before and one what parts look different all right what parts seem the same well the fact that we are doing something on the screen and doing some calculation and putting the calculation somewhere that looks the same that's what my tip calculator did this tip tip calculator does the same thing all right so there's probably a lot of commonality there what's different there's no button to click it happens as I'm typing in all right. So, so, so the, the the listener then should be on each button press then still, right? Because as I click one, it sends it to calculates, puts it on there. As I click two next for twelve bucks, it would send it again as it. Um, no. I'm just trying to figure out how you would have done it as a live action. Okay. As you press. It's a different kind of listener. It's not a listener on the keypad. Uh -huh. That is just the Android keyboard. It's a listener on the text control. Oh, okay. So there's a listener on the text control for when the value of the text control changes to go and do the calculation. So in a nutshell, I mean, if we if there was a button here, it would be virtually the same as mine with the slider control. But the difference is is there is a different kind of user event that's kicking off the calculation. And in this case, the event is changing the value of the text box or the edit text field, not clicking on the button. So it's a different listener. There's no button with an on-click listener. There's a edit text with a text change listener. All right. And then also to kind of close the loop, there is a slider with an on-change listener as well. So let's take a look at this. And let's start at the bottom and work our way up. Nothing exciting in the manifest file, near as I remember. Nope. In the resources, we have our strings. Nothing exciting in there, just like the other examples. Drawable. We have our icons, same thing. We have three icons, actually, for the different screen densities. For the layout, we have a 
different kind of layout. And this layout is a table layout. All right. So what are the three kinds of layouts we've seen so far? Table layouts, one. Took the easy one for myself. Relative layout. And a linear, right? A linear layout simply boom, 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 just in a row. About as simple as you can get. A relative layout is where you describe things as being positioned in relation to other things. So you can put something on your screen and then say something is below it, something is above it, something is to the right, something is to the left, and you can piece together your UI that way. Or you can have a table layout where you have, much like a table in HTML, you have rows and columns, all right? Or rows and, and yeah, rows and columns, I guess is the best way to put it. Again, in more involved applications, you're going to see mix and match of, the, of this. In other words, you may have a linear view and one of the elements in, or linear layout rather, and one of the elements in the linear layout might be a table view. So you have your first thing, your second thing, boom, a table, your third thing, your fourth thing, and so on down the line. So we're going to learn these basic layouts and then they can be combined in, in a lot of different ways to get flexibility. All right, so there's our table layout. As we're accustomed to, a table is comprised of a list of rows. Top row contains A label for bill total and a text box, an edit text field, that we're going across three columns. If we notice the table at most is four columns, right? This table, this table row has the label for tip, the one amount, the second amount, the third amount. So there's four values going across. So because this only has two elements, we say the one element takes up three columns. No, I'm talking about where it says bill total and then the text box. Oh, okay. All right. Notice the rows below it where it has tip, 10%, 15%, 20%. That's four columns. But the first row of the table is only two columns, so the second column takes up three columns. We then have a row that displays the table headings. We have a row that contains the 10, 15, and 20 percent. We have a row that contains the totals for 10, 15, and 20 percent. We finally then have a text view for a custom percentage with a sleek bar, a sleek bar, a seek bar that we use to slide back and forth. It goes across two columns. All right. Now notice what we have here. A seek bar by default goes from 1 to 100, all right? And we set the attribute, the progress attribute, attribute to 18. What that does is that defaults to 18% this custom calculation. Then we have the rest, a box for the tip, a box for the total, for the custom. 
New things for this one. I like to point out new things as we go from example to example. The new things for this one are that we, use, we are using a table layout and we're using a seek bar. All right. Now, into the code. Bunch of imports. What do those imports represent? What does import mean? Uh, those are like the namespaces, the certain things that you're bringing. Well, I think they are called, in C sharp, they're namespaces, but you're importing the class libraries from other things, All right. from other implementations. What you're doing here, effectively, is there could be within an application. something called activity that isn't an Android activity. Let's say I'm writing a um, an Android app, let's say I'm writing an application for student life here and I create an activity object to mean the activities like you know um, donate blood or a basketball game, or a concert. I mean that kind of activity, all right? We can't guarantee that I'm not going to pick the name for a class that doesn't correspond to something in Android. So if I say activity, which activity am I going to get? Well, you get to say that, all right? In Java, these are called the packages that they live in. All right, so you can specify the package that something is in. You have two choices when you refer to a class like this. I could either type in this every time. Pardon me? No, no. What I'm saying is I could do this. I could do that. And I could do that every time I do one of these other things as well. I could put the package, the full, the full path to that class. Doesn't Java have a wild card for that too? Couldn't you just do import android.app.star? For the import, yes. Yeah, okay. For the import, yes. Because that's where it differs from C-sharp, right? Correct. C-sharp, you can't do that. Too. Correct. Um, and... However, if I had to do this every time I referred to an activity, that would be, that'd be a pain. All right? Actually, in this case, there's only one activity object. But if I had to do it for every text view, if I had to put in android.widget.textView in front of every text view, do that. I wouldn't have to import anything then, but I'd have a lot of typing. You used to have to do it that way, didn't you? Before they started imports like that? It wasn't like the original Java, you had to actually do that every single time? I didn't. I, ever since I've been coding in Java, you, you, I've used imports. Oh, okay. So I, I don't know. If that was, that would have been a long time ago. Oh, okay. what, you said those are called, because in, in C Sharp, those are namespaces. What are they called? Uh, packages. Packages. Yeah, effectively, it's the same idea. Yeah. So you can type or you can import. By importing, that doesn't like bring anything in. It's not like an include file in PHP. All right? It's simply saying, hey, when I'm talking about an activity, I mean this guy, the one that's in that package. When I talk about a bundle, that's what I mean. All right? And so on. 
So that's why you have to do an import. The nice thing is, is there's IntelliSense, I believe, in both um, Android Studio or, and uh, um, Eclipse, that if you start using uh, a class and you haven't imported it, it will, like, tell you, like, are you, you know, maybe you want to, I don't know what that class means, maybe you want to import this, all right? And, and that's, that's kind of nice, and you just click on it and import it. All right. We're going to ignore this part for now, these constants. All right. This relates to saving and restoring state. We'll forget about that for now. We're going to start looking at here. These are all the attributes of this activity. Now, if you notice in my previous example, I don't think I had any attributes. All right. Here I do. Why do I have attributes here in this case, but I didn't in the other case? What other case are you talking about? The, the example that we were just looking at, my, my tip calculator. Um, I don't think I have any this, attributes. This extends it, so you can just use uh, polymorphism to bring it back, can't you? Okay, no, not really. These two, these two aren't, I mean, they're both tip calculators, but they're not really related on an object level. By declaring these as attributes, what can I do with them? Where can I use them? Within that class. Anywhere within that class. Any method within that class. All right? So by declaring these as attributes, if on the onCreate I say, hey, let me grab a pointer to this edit text field called tip10 edit text, guess what? I can use that variable anywhere in this class, all right? So that's one of the reasons you declare them as attributes, because you want to share that. Either you declare it as an attribute or you pass it. In my case of the simple tip calculator, I only had like one method, all right? I, and, and so all I had to do is associate the button with the on-click listener, then the on-click listener is the only one that needed to know about the amount and the so there's really no need to make those guys attributes. But here, I have a bunch of methods. And it would be a pain to pass things around, so I declare them as attributes. All right? Again, um, we set the content view to our layout main. The technical word for this, or the word that they use, is inflate the GUI. You know? It, it's almost like... It's almost like the, the XML file is sort of a dehydrated GUI, all right? By inflating it, or by setting it, you're bringing it to life. The XML file is sort of the specifications for what that screen's going to look like. By doing this, you're actually bringing it to life, and you're creating all the objects that you said exist. So by doing that, I've created all the objects I've said is in my, uh, is in my GUI. Now, though, I have to get pointers to them, all right? Because those objects exist, but my code needs to do stuff with it, so I have to point to them. So essentially, I have that same statement that we took a lot of time on last time repeated, you know, half dozen, 10, 12 times, where I say, find the thing that has an ID of this, cast it as an edit text, and boom. This was declared as an attribute, so I can use that everywhere within this object. With, uh, in Java, mm -hmm. if you use the triple forward slash, does that leave it as a message for when somebody's implementing a method like in C Sharp? I forget what the definition term is for it, but it basically it gives you the message when you're implementing a method, it, you can do a triple forward slash. And when they start to write that, it'll give them like a hint as to how to use that method properly. I don't remember what it's called. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. That would, I would think that would almost be more of a function of the IDE than the, the language itself. It, no, it's built within the C-sharp language to a triple forward slash 
You know, because when you're doing okay. the IntelliSense, and IntelliSense right. automatically pops up with the methods, right. and then you highlight over top of that methods, and then it'll tell you like the overloads and things right. like that right, for right. the method. It'll, you get a triple slash will okay. show uh, a message to the okay. user. That's a good say. question. I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. I, I've not seen it done that way. All right. I lied. This one doesn't do. This one does do. The, this one does the listener, kind of the same way that my tip calculator did. At least my the second version of my tip calculator. I, uh, except again, it's not a at text, text change listener. Yes. Yeah. So that's how he's getting the live. That's how he's getting the live. Yeah. And it's it's creating a bill, uh, bill te edit text watcher. So one of the one of the greatest. I, was, I talked to somebody not so long ago that's been programming for ever. So what would you ever recommend to like a junior programmer? He said just looking at other people's codes. And you'll never learn anything like you will from just lo looking at other people's codes. You know, even better than that is changing it. You know, if you can go in and you you can say, let's let's add a, even if it's a silly change, like let's add a fourth column for tips, for a different amount of tips, you know, for, for uh, a 25% because, you know, the waitress, um, you know, um, brought out your, your meal on a silver platter and, you know, and, and, you know, and was always refilling your coffee and so you really want to give a fantastic tip. All right. To go back and change it would would do that. Yeah. At any rate, yeah, it does it does the listeners in a in a simple way uh, or a similar way. It calls a object that actually gets created down here. Let's see, right here. It creates a text watcher called Bill Edit Text Watcher as an attribute, all right? And then it assigns that to the text box as the text watcher for it does a similar thing to the seek bar with the set on seek bar change listener. So now we have, again, slightly different syntax. Remember I said new and then had the name of it. They actually created um, the object down here. All right. Here's where they created it and here's where they implemented it. Now the text changed interface all right has several has an on text changed has a after text changed and a before text changed method and even though we're not doing anything with two of the three methods we have to put them in there because this is that interface we have to define that and the on seek listener has on progress changed, on start tracking, on stop tracking. We're only interested when you're done with the um, with the um, sliding the seek bar to calculate the percentage. If you notice, anytime that changes as you slide it, it does the recalculation, and it does it immediately. If you slide slide it. It slides it live. It's changing it. Because it, you, you should do that for this course from now on. Say, in order to come to next class, take this application and put it on your phone so that you can play with it. Well, yeah, that, that's. I mean, that's the ideal. If you if you do have a phone, and and also to download those examples from Deedle yeah. uh, and do that. Yeah, that's that's sort of the optimum because that helps with being able to see it and and seeing how it behaves and so on. All right, any questions at this point? All right, we will finish up next time, which really 
I wouldn't anticipate spending too much time on this because about the only thing different is, is that there's more stuff here. We're not setting one label, we're setting like seven labels or something like that. So um, not anything really drastically different, just we're listing for different events and we're doing more updating of stuff. And so we will look at that. We'll spend a few minutes looking at that, but again, it shouldn't be anything earth shattering. And then we'll go into our next example. Questions? All right. I will need to borrow a USB drive from someone again.